Hello, Boilermakers! My name is Steve Schultz, and I'm the University Legal Counsel. On behalf of my colleagues, welcome to Purdue. Now, you all know that your new, your new school is world-renowned for its groundbreaking research and its great graduates as the alma mater of the first person on the moon and the last one to leave it. You also might even know that Purdue is sometimes called the cradle of quarterbacks. But you probably didn't know that in 2015, Purdue became the first public university in the United States to adopt a formal commitment to freedom of expression based on the so-called Chicago principles. These principles are a statement that's been praised as a landmark declaration of the unique importance of free speech on any university campus. So what's the big deal about free speech? As you may have read in your preview materials for tonight to get ready for BGR, American colleges and universities have long been recognized as the marketplace of ideas, a place where ideas compete and even clash. This means your new campus will be full of situations in which others will inevitably say things that you may not agree with. And you should know this now. That's okay. Each of you has a right to voice an opinion, and it's up to you to decide how and whether to respond to those of others. Purdue's committed to being a place of free and open inquiry and debate, frankly, because that's how a lot of learning takes place. At the same time, we value civility, respect for others, and an awareness that no one person is just like the next. Those differences are what make a university like ours a great one. I want you to listen closely to how Purdue's statement of commitment to freedom of expression puts this. Of course, the ideas of different members of the university community will often and quite naturally conflict. But it's not the proper role of the university to attempt to shield individuals from ideas and opinions they find unwelcome, disagreeable, or even deeply offensive. Although the university greatly values civility, and although all members of the university community share in the responsibility for maintaining a climate of mutual respect, concerns about civility and mutual respect can never be used as a justification for closing off discussion of ideas, however offensive or disagreeable those ideas may be to some members of our community. So you might be thinking, these can be challenging concepts particularly when you hear speech that any reasonable person would find deeply offensive, right? You might be asking yourself, so what, just what kind of crazy ideas am I going to be encountering on campus? That's what tonight's all about. With our starring cast of student leaders, our panel and I, along with some pre-recorded guests, are going to be walking you through some free speech scenarios, which you very likely may be encountering during your time here. First, let me introduce our panel. Dr. Pat Kane, Associate Professor of Philosophy and an inaugural faculty fellow in Purdue's new Cornerstone Integrated Liberal Arts Program. Pat's a recipient of the Kaufmel Outstanding Undergraduate Teaching Award. He teaches ethics, and his scholarship focuses on better understanding human dignity and moral obligation. As a former member of our University Senate, we consider Pat one of our thought leaders on matters of freedom of expression and academic freedom on Purdue's campus. Next, Elisa Christmas Rollick, Purdue's Vice President for Ethics and Compliance and one of my fellow attorneys here at Purdue. Elisa knows the law and particularly the First Amendment very well. And finally, Dr. Katie Summersheim, Purdue's Dean of Students. Boilermakers in the house! She's the person we all affectionately refer to around campus as Dr. Katie, and her office is, of course, focused on making sure you have a great student experience during your time at Purdue. A uh, quick round in advance of, of applause for our panel. Our hope is that tonight and in the conversations that follow, you'll have a better understanding 
of the importance of free speech on campus and maybe even come to recognize and appreciate how and why you might exercise this right yourself, both while you're here and after you're gone. Now, you all know that this topic has received quite a lot of attention lately, particularly with the very troubling events of this past weekend in Charlottesville. But the fact is, free speech on campus has been gaining attention in our public debate for several years now. Just two months ago, in fact, the Senate Judiciary Committee held a hearing on this topic on Capitol Hill. Here are just a few remarks from Senator Ted Cruz that introduce a few key themes for this evening. Free speech matters. Diversity matters. Diversity of people's backgrounds, but also diversity of thought, diversity of ideas. Universities are meant to be a challenging environment for young people to encounter ideas they've never seen, they've never imagined, and that they might passionately disagree with. The First Amendment is not about opinions you agree with. It's not about opinions that are right and reasonable. The First Amendment is about opinions that you passionately disagree with and the right of others to express them. I'm one who agrees with John Stuart Mill, the best solution for bad ideas, for bad speech is more speech and better ideas. You'll hear more about those ideas in the next hour. But no matter what you take away tonight, we want to get this across. As with the rest of your education at Purdue, Purdue's goal is to make you great citizens so that when you're sitting in this very hall to receive your diploma one day, you're ready to go out into the world to express your views, to engage in debate, to stand up for what you believe in. This is how President Daniels put it to the class of 2015 as they sat in your seats at their commencement. At a minimum, you should have learned that our freedom starts with free speech. And free speech means disagreement. And disagreement means that now and then you will be upset by things you hear and read. Or as people like to say these days, offended. If you absorb anything of our Constitution, you know that it contains no right not to be offended. If anything, by protecting speech of all kinds, it guarantees that you will be. Well, as they say, deal with it. And if you're disturbed enough, then answer it with superior facts and arguments. Your diplomas say that Purdue has equipped you for this. Okay, we're gonna be moving to our first speech scenario for the evening, and I ask for everyone's kind attention. Uh, please be prepared to observe some things in the scenarios that you may find objectionable. Bear in mind that our student actors are not expressing their actual viewpoints. And finally, while these hypothetical situations are loosely based on experiences at Purdue or maybe other campuses around the country, they don't depict actual events. And any similarity to actual events or characters is purely coincidental. And finally, to ensure they're not a distraction to others, I'm gonna ask that you turn off your cell phones, but before you do, would you all mind if we got a quick selfie with you? Thank you. Okay, we go to our first scenario, the case of the uninvited campus preacher in our midst. Brother Max is preaching his message in the most public area of campus. He's well versed in his rights regarding free speech. Groups of students are passing by, reacting to him as he engages in his expressive activity and as they go to class. Max blows his whistle and proclaims, Women with short hair and those who wear slacks are all whores, and they're bound to burn in hell, right alongside the druggies, the fornicators, and of course, the homosexuals. I can't go to class. I can't believe I'm hearing these terrible words. I'm really offended. I need to go back to my room. He's honestly the worst, just ignore him. Oh my God, could you believe this guy? 
You know what we should do. Yeah, we should go beat his ass for spreading that hate speech. Let's go debate this idiot. If we stand up to him and show him what we feel and how ridiculous his ideas are, maybe we can bring attention to this campus's true values. You know what, Jeff? That's a good idea. What do you think, Winston? I think it's a great idea. All right, let's go. Okay. So, uh, panel, we have an uninvited speaker operating in a public space on campus, one of our mall spaces. Um, first, I think it's important for everybody to understand that the First Amendment applies to Purdue as a state university. This means that speech protected under the First Amendment cannot be censored or punished by the university. Now, as with every rule, there are exceptions to what is considered protected speech. I think we have those on a slide to show. But these are very narrow exceptions. Do we have those? There they are. These are the ones the Supreme Court has recognized over the years. Elisa, we're going to start with you. We can get into um, why the location of this encounter matters, but first things first, do you think what the preacher's doing here is protected speech, or does it fall within one of these exceptions? Well, certainly it's speech, and it's speech that might be offensive. And as we saw in the skit, it was offensive to a number of um, folks who um, heard what he had to say. Um, but it is protected speech. Um, we don't have an exception, uh, and there they are, uh, that would apply in this circumstance. Um, the campus is an open campus. And that means that just like your parents and friends can come visit you on the campus, um, members of the general public can come visit the campus, can speak on the campus, and certainly can speak in areas that are not disruptive to the university. So here, we do, it's uh, certainly in the, in the center of the campus, um, there are no classes that are being held outdoors, because that might make a difference. If we had a class that was in session and couldn't um, carry on its discussions um, because of the noise, um, but we certainly would have to look at it in terms of the disruption, and not because of what's being said or whether we agree or disagree with what's being said. And you don't think it might be a true threat, for example, or harassment? Well, certainly, uh, the, he was calling people names. Um, they heard those names, uh, and they are, the individuals were deeply offended by it. Uh, we had one of the students say that you know, she really wanted to go back to her room and, and, and consider it. And you know. um, but uh, in terms of what the courts have said, it's not. So, no. University does have the right to control its spaces, though, right? Um, right, absolutely. So there are certain spaces on campus, like a classroom, an auditorium, and other places on campus where we do restrict who, what, when, or where, uh, what can happen in those spaces and when they can happen in those spaces. But here, it's the open part of the campus. Uh, the public comes and goes. It's at a time when the campus is open, and even though uh, we may disagree with what people have to say, uh, they're permitted to say them. Got to be viewpoint neutral. We're going to bring that point out. Let's hear from Professor Nadine Strassen about these points. She s talks about this thing called the, our duty of, uh, as a university of maintaining viewpoint neutrality. Uh, Nadine's the former head of the ACLU and a recognized expert on free speech. She was speaking from this podium uh, at Purdue in 2015. Here's Nadine Strassen. Throughout my talk, I'm going to use the term offensive speech to refer to any speech conveying any thought that any of us hates because we consider the idea to be offensive, evil, dangerous, upsetting, harmful in any way. Today, we tend to use the term hate speech to refer to a specific type of offensive speech, namely biased or stereotyped ideas on the basis of race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or any other aspect of social identity. 
Contrary to much popular misunderstanding, there is no general exception to the First Amendment's free speech guarantee on the ground that the speech's message is offensive or hateful. To the contrary, the Supreme Court has repeatedly reaffirmed that the bedrock, its word bedrock principle underlying our free speech rights is that government may never suppress speech just because officials or citizens disapprove of the ideas that it conveys, even if the vast majority of citizens consider those ideas absolutely abhorrent. Uh, this cardinal principle is usually called content neutrality or viewpoint neutrality. It bars government from restricting any speech just because of any negative psychological or emotional reaction to its message. Instead, the government must neutrally and even-handedly protect freedom equally for all ideas. And this important uh, duty belongs to all government bodies, including public universities, such as Purdue. So Pat, uh, we saw a very similar situation last year, the year before that, probably going to see it this year. As a faculty member, what are your concerns and maybe advice for students? Yeah, so I have at least two concerns about this kind of scenario. I don't want students to feel surprised if something like this happens, and I don't want them to feel powerless when it does. So one thing I'd say is you should expect that there'll be uninvited speakers on campus, and they may say something quite offensive, and maybe that will make it a little bit less jarring if you expect it. And you don't want to feel powerless. So it's helpful to think about the choices that you have if you come across something like this. One choice is, of course, to avoid or ignore the speaker, not give them the attention that they're craving or creating a bigger crowd. You could go have a cup of coffee or go to class or go to the CORAC instead. Or you could choose to think about what they have to say and think about what you might say in response. You could engage with the speaker. And here at Purdue, with the people you're encountering and the things you'll be learning, you might learn how to effectively engage with the speaker. Or you could express an opinion to others about what the speaker has to say. And you might even get together with some people and make a public statement together about what you think is important. Thanks, Pat. Dr. Katie, how would the Office of uh, Dean of Students respond to this situation if they got a complaint about the preacher? Well, first of all, uh, the key point is we're here to help. Uh, the Dean of Students Office is here to help, but multiple resources and people across campus are here uh, to be available. And I'll, I'll highlight some of those resources here in a minute. Um, I, I think as has been said, it is probably more likely than not that within the next couple of days, certainly within the first couple of weeks, uh, you will encounter something similar to this, some street preacher uh, spewing these words of, of hate and uh, disgust your way. Uh, and as Pat said, you have options uh, and we want you to utilize those options. Turning back to the particular skit that we had here, though, I want to specifically highlight the, the second and the third uh, reactions. The second one was, I, I believe the quote was, let's go beat his ass. Um, as the dean of students, I'm not in favor of that. <laughs> and as a proponent of free speech, I'm not in favor of that. Uh, violence uh, is not free speech, and it should never be what we resort to. We should fight speech with speech. The third scenario uh, is, is beautiful in that these students are choosing to, uh, again, knowing you have a wide range of choices, this particular group chose to uh, confront the speaker, to have a conversation, to engage in it. Other people will choose to not even dignify the speaker with a response or, or trying to engage, and that's okay. You have options. But as far as resources, considering the reaction of the student in the first group, I'll highlight some other things a little bit later um, and recognize what that student may be going through. Uh, but we do encourage you, if you're having a difficult time with something, talk to your RA. Talk with the faculty fellow. 
talk to your, your faculty members, to your advisors, certainly the Dean of Students Office. Um, there are multiple resources and multiple people who, who care about your success and want, you, want to help you uh, work through any kind of challenges or issues that may be preventing you from success. I love the discussion of the options and uh, combating speech with more speech and that third example you gave, but as it relates to the university's action, as we've ta talked about, for all the reasons, no exceptions apply, so the university's not going to step in to muzzle this preacher. Uh, another one of the recent guest speakers that we've had uh, at Purdue on the topic of free speech is Azar Majid from the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, one of the leading groups in our nation that, that focuses on this topic. He was here in 2016, and in this segment, he speaks to sort of the practical limits of the ability of the university to come in and, and do something about an uninvited speaker, Azar Majid. There's a point to be made that the answer to everything is not to have the school step in and intervene on behalf of a student or a parent or a teacher or whatever. You know, I, I, uh, many things can be resolved without that kind of heavy-handed uh, administrative action. So Pat, short of that heavy-handed administrative action that Azar mentioned, I know you've thought a lot about this. Um, you know, just because the university is committed to upholding free speech, it doesn't mean that we condone all ideas on campus, right? That's right. And I think you put it quite well. Uninvited speakers and even invited speakers here at Purdue don't speak for the university. The university promotes free speech, but not everything that's said on campus. But it's important to think about why that is. And having a public forum on campus isn't just the law. I think it's helpful to realize why it's a pretty good idea, especially in a pluralistic society. In our society, we need a place or places where people can express competing views and react to each other's views. In a university, which is a place where we're seeking knowledge and where we're looking to the future, that's a very good place to have a public forum. But of course, not all ideas are good ideas. Not all ideas are right or true. Some ideas are in fact silly, bad, false, poisonous even. The problem is we don't all agree on which are which. And it's not a very good idea for the government to be making all of those decisions. So what then? Well, it falls to you and to me and to groups of us to sort through the good and the bad ideas and to try to promote the good ones and try to confront the bad ones. And that's a burden and a responsibility that we can choose to take up on occasion. But it falls to us. Now, occasionally, there are some ideas that might be expressed, some events that might happen that might be directly incompatible with the whole point of the university, threaten the core values of the university, and then the university, through a spokesman, may make a statement. Right? But even then, I think it's important for us to realize there are lots of things that need to be said about bad ideas that we need to say and the university might not say. I love how you put that, Pat. And um, Nadine Strassen, when she was here a couple years ago, spoke to this issue. Let's see how she uh, framed that issue. It's also essential for others to respond to hate speech, not only its targets, but also especially other leaders in the pertinent community. So on university campuses, the university president, as well as student government organizations should also speak out strongly. In response to hate speech, they should defend the right to convey even hateful, hated ideas, but they should also denounce such ideas. I like to describe this approach as censuring speech, not censoring speech. President Daniels recently pledged precisely this approach here at Purdue. As he said, there would be no swifter or surer way to be condemned and ostracized at Purdue than to say or do anything even remotely racist, and the condemnation would start with me. All right, we're rolling. We're going to move on to our next scenario. 
This is the case of flags or symbols in the residence halls. It's move-in day, and the RAs are busy helping students as they set up their new homes for the year. Let's see what happens. Man, I can't wait to get settled in. Hanging up my new flag is gonna make my room look sweet. I love my new Darwin-inspired poster. Hope the roommate likes it too. Gross. Ew. Why does she have that? What is wrong with him? Gosh. Did you see that poster? How could anyone believe that we evolved from monkeys? Like seriously, I'm sick and tired of people pushing their own agenda on this issue. You should make them take it down now. That confederate flag is so offensive and hurtful. Its history is totally racist. What an awful symbol of discrimination. You gotta make sure he doesn't hang that up. So here we have a non-public forum. Yeah, great job, students. This is a space that's not out in the public, like Elisa was talking about, and the university clearly has the ability to regulate expression to a greater degree than if it were out in a public space. And obviously, the university has a number of interests. We want to make sure things comply with the fire code in terms of signs and posters and such. Dr. Katie, when your office gets the call from these RAs, what are, what are you going to do about it? We just let those calls go to voicemail. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Remember, we're here to help. Uh, so a scenario like this really gets into uh, viewpoint neutrality. And Nadine Strassman said it earlier. It'll be, it was a theme on our uh, first scenario and is now again. Um, basically, you have two roommates or floor mates, people that are going to be moving in, as all of you have just done, and people are entitled in their living space, as the rules are written currently, to uh, hang and decorate your rooms as you so choose. Uh, viewpoint neutrality means that as you so choose is the prominent factor there. So if one chooses to do the Confederate flag and the other chooses to have the Darwin fish, that is, that is absolutely appropriate as we view free speech and viewpoint neutrality. Now, if, however, one person tries to uh, hang that same symbol in the window, uh, we have to operate within the rules and frameworks, the, the guidelines within the residence halls. And there's a fire safety standard that prohibits anything hung in the windows because of the risk of fire. So there's a spot where you can't do those things. But otherwise, in your residence hall rooms, generally speaking on those walls, you can put anything up that expresses your view. Now, what we encourage students to do during this time is not necessarily run to the RA with this as, as the issue, but instead challenge you as boilermakers to try to work some of this out on your own, to recognize that you are now new students at a major global university and you have an opportunity to express your views. So the ideal situation would be both of those individuals sitting down, having a conversation, expressing to one another why the other finds their sign, their symbol, uh, especially uh, troublesome, especially offensive, what it means to them. In other words, this opportunity to engage, this opportunity to defend one's opinion uh, is really a solidifying uh, step in what I call values clarification. You're testing the assumptions, you're testing the theories that you bring to campus, things that you were raised uh, believing are, are true and accurate, and, and certainly carry that on. But come with an open mind to hear what your roommate, floor mates, whomever may have to say. Um, obviously, these signs were, were maybe considered more extreme for this particular um, scenario, but it's, it's very real that you're going to have different of opinions and ideas of things, and the best next step is to have the conversation with one another. Do so as a boilermaker with respect and dignity and courtesy for one another. Agree to disagree. 
Um, if agreeing to disagree is not an option and there's still significant conflict, or you still feel like you'd like to debrief this further, there are additional resources. You can talk to your RA. You can talk to your faculty fellow. You can talk to your faculty member. You can talk to the dean of students. Um, there are people and resources that can help you sort of decompress and process uh, the challenges that are in front of you. Great stuff, Katie. Thank you. Elisa, great offense taken by both sides here. Either one of them have a basis for a claim of harassment against the other? At this point, no, uh, because under the scenario that we have, um, they're each using symbols, and they're powerful symbols. Uh, that's what makes them um, symbols, right? They, they, they speak to more than uh, what they would appear to be. Um, here, uh, in looking at it, you would, um, you know, say that uh, um, neither one of them is having their educational um, opportunities um, eclipsed by the presence of the sign. Again, symbols are powerful, and they can affect you powerfully, but you can also ignore them. And so, um, and you can have a discussion, and the person may tell you, really don't care what you think. So we don't want you to feel that, um, and while you can have that conversation, the other person doesn't really have to um, listen to you uh, or even care what your view is of the symbol. But we would hope that in a university community um, that you could have an initial conversation, that you could start from a place of um, discussing with somebody who, uh, without assuming that they're intending to harm you, have the conversation where you share what the effect is on you or might be or how others might understand the symbol. And then the person has the option of keeping the symbol, changing it, thinking about it. You may change your view. Uh, you may understand a different way that the symbol was intended or meant. Um, so here again, uh, because uh, no one is being targeted by it, even though, you know, most of us before going to college, you didn't have to worry about offensive symbols in your home. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what you, you know, are feeling is this is my home. This is where I go to sleep. This is where I eat. Mm -hmm. And yet here are views that are different from mine. Uh, but that's part of the college experience. That's part of being in a public university uh, in this country. And so, um, no, uh, given this scenario, there would not be either a violation of university policy or um, anything else. Got it, got it. Pat, what would you add? Yeah, so I, I completely agree, especially with Elisa's point about the power of symbols. Our symbols remind us of things that are important to us. Notice how both of the students was initially really enthusiastic about their own symbol. And that tells us something. And they were hoping that they would meet people who would share the same enthusiasm for their symbols. Uh, but of course, our symbols can also divide us. Our symbols can mean negative things as well as positive things. So one thing I'd suggest is you keep in mind that not everybody is going to like your symbols. And you should try not to initially assume the worst of people with other symbols. But as you both mentioned, having a conversation and understanding what other people are trying to communicate. But that's tough, especially, like you said, in, you, in your home. The proximity makes it difficult seeing a symbol uh, every day. Uh, and that's why it's good to have a conversation. You know, when I think about those conversations, I think I was taught to try to speak the truth in love. And failing that, at least go for respect. And even that's, that's hard, and, and we make mistakes. But even when you speak the truth in love, sometimes the truth is blunt. And sometimes love can be harsh. When something offensive is being communicated, it's OK to feel offense, and it's okay to express that to others, right? 
I'm just going to interject right here and say, uh, speaking the truth and love, there's, there's one caveat on this symbol thing, and that is that clearly the Purdue symbol is always superior to the IU symbol. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and that's something, that's something at Purdue that you can practice and learn, and we're going to get even better at. <laughs> All three of you have really conveyed so well the power of this empathy, constructive engagement to resolve differences, uh, especially when you're con confronted with uh, ideas that you don't agree with. Uh, Jeffrey Stone is a law professor at the University of Chicago. He actually was the driving architect for the Chicago Principles. And he was here with Azar Majid last year for a panel, and he emphasized this same point. Let's see how he put it when asked a, a question by an international student. In modern time, we say, in, in, in a family, say, I'm from China, so we've been taught about the value of respect our elders. Um, and also, like I said, in a company um, interview setting, say, like interviewees have to like, respect the interviewers. But I want to know like, about the art of conversation, the art of debate, art of arguments. How can we um, voice our concerns and also like, how, um, the freedom of think without like, sounding arrogant, with, without offending people? And also, in a, in a, in a culture where like, entertainment, jokes, personal charm, leadership um, behavior is sometimes is, is, like, valued more above. Um, the value of ideas, the value of personal opinions, like how can you find a space or personal balance in it? Thank you. Do you want to? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, um, you know, it always comes down to uh, being civil, respectful, and polite. I think if you treat people the way that you would want to be treated, that is something to aspire to. And in my experience, and I think many people would say the same thing, that's the most effective way to reach people. You know, as a First Amendment uh, advocate, am I going to defend your right to to be uncivil and uh, to not show respect to somebody? Yes, as long as it's protected speech, but uh, that might not be the best way to win yourself allies and to convince other people and get your message across. So I, th I think you know, those values of civility and politeness and respect, those are uh, to be aspired to uh, as a normative matter, even if it's not something that should be legally uh, required of you, uh, either under university policy or, or under the law. And the best, I can give, best advice I can give it, which I've learned a long time ago, is when arguing and debating with people is to put myself inside their head and understand what they're hearing and how they hear it and couch arguments in a way that will be most effective for where they're coming from, it, as well as being civil and respectful. And I, I think if one is conscious of doing that, one can be very effective, um, both as persuasion um, but also in terms of, of civility. Katie, there has been a lot of talk in this debate about free speech on college campuses, about uh, safe spaces. How should we think about those in the context of being confronted by challenging speech? Well, of course we want you to feel safe, to feel safe in your environment, in your community, in your residence halls, in your classrooms, et cetera, et cetera. But in the context of free speech, there really isn't anything considered a safe space, a safe place from uh, being challenged, having your thoughts challenged, having your ideas challenged. Um, and that's actually a good thing. To have your mind stretched, to have your uh, values challenged, to have your uh, thoughts uh, pushed, is an important part of why you're here. As uh, students at a university, uh, we want you to cross that stage, not only with the degree in hand, but with an education in your hearts and minds. And the way to get there um, is to expose you to as many different ideas and opportunities as possible. It's this whole marketplace of ideas concept. This will help you become true global citizen scholars uh, where you can move on and be contributing members, contributing citizens of the environment in which you will next live and reside and contribute. 
to uh, kind of sum up this philosophy of what a university is supposed to be fo for, I'm going to cite a, a quick quote by Clark Kerr. He is a former president at the University of California um, many years ago, but what he said really holds true today. He said, the university is not engaged in making ideas safe for students. It is engaged in making students safe for ideas. Such a great quote, still relevant today. Uh, Van Jones, an attorney, author, well-known progressive commentator, uh, had this to say about the same topic when he was on a panel again at the uh, Chicago Institute for Politics. Let's hear Van Jones. There are two ideas about safe spaces. One is a very good idea and one is a terrible idea. The idea of being physically safe on a campus, not being subjected to sexual harassment and physical abuse or, 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 or something like that or being targeted specifically personally for some kind of hate speech, you are an N-word, whatever. That, I, hey, perfectly fine with that. Perfectly fine with that. But there's another view that is now, I think, ascendant, which I think is just a horrible view, which is that I need to be safe ideologically. I need to be safe emotionally. I just need to feel good all the time. And if someone says something that I don't like, that is a problem for everybody else, including the administration. And I think that is a terrible idea for the following reason. I don't want you to be safe ideologically. I don't want you to be safe emotionally. I want you to be strong. That's different. I'm not going to pave the jungle for you. Put on some boots and learn how to deal with adversity. I'm not going to take all the weights out of the gym. That's the whole point of the gym. <laughs> this is the gym. You can't live on a campus where people say stuff you don't like, and these people can't fire you, they can't arrest you, they can't beat you up, they can just say stuff you don't like, and you get to say stuff back. <laughs> and this you cannot bear. It's colorful. Elisa, thoughts on Van's observation? Well, he's clearly a graduate of a top-ranked law school shared by at least two of us here on the stage. Um, nonetheless, um, I think it's, it's important to recognize, though, that it's not as stark a contrast in either or as he perhaps um, conveys. I mean, it's, it's humorous to say, you know, we won't take the weights out of the gym. But we do need to understand that some things that can be said can have terrific, horrific emotional uh, impacts. And when that happens, we want folks to feel that there's a place that they can go that there are uh, resources here on campus. If you have a question about whether or not the behaviors um, violate our policies, that we're here to talk to you about it. And we're here to support you through your time here. And also to encourage the rest of us that if we see these sorts of um, behaviors, speech, that we can use our speech to support our classmates, our colleagues, and that we can speak as well. Yeah, and, and then of course we have the, the resources that Dr. Katie spoke of earlier. Thanks to all of you. I'm gonna go on to our next scenario, and uh, it's the case of classroom disruption during a lecture and discussion. So during a course that deals with climate change, a professor is presenting data on global warming. As she goes into the role greenhouse gases play, she seeks to engage the class and challenge them to think about this as a threat to our planet. 
Let's join class in progress just after the professor has gone over some measurement methods and temperature trends. We see here there have been record high temperatures recently and the data show a definite increase in the average temperature overall. This new report just released last week by scientists from 13 federal agencies says this. Evidence for a changing climate abounds from the top of the atmosphere to the depths of the ocean. Folks, we really need to be concerned and start grappling with, yes? Professor, you keep describing this as though it is actual fact. Remember when everybody in the world was convinced that the Earth was the center of the universe for like 2,000 years? How can you be so sure about this? Well, it's true, these early astronomers didn't model the cosmos correctly. They didn't have the means to. But now we can make observations from hard data that conclusively demonstrates a clear temperature increase. Okay, but back then, didn't they also have da get data from their observations, get observations from their data? I mean, they thought that the sun revolved around the Earth. I guess I just don't buy your certainty, especially when there's contrary evidence on the other side. Okay, so these ancient astronomers did make observations, but they were so rudimentary because of their limited methods. Today, we have a much better understanding of the way the universe works, like the law of gravity, for example. Okay, I get that the scientific method is more advanced than when Newton got hit on the head by an apple. However, isn't this just all for the search of the ongoing truth? I guess I just find it troubling, if not a bit arrogant, that the humankind is responsible for global warming. Well, I have to admire your inquiring mind. This is worth further discussion. If you would like, you can come to my office hours and I can discuss the evidence with you in greater detail. My door is always open. However, for this class, we do need to move on. Okay, so we have a classroom setting. Uh, we have an interesting intersection here of free speech in the classroom for the student, but also related to that, something, uh, a close cousin of that doctrine called academic freedom, which is uh, something that the professor has to, uh, in terms of discretion, to conduct the class as he or she sees fit. So Pat, uh, would you like to speak a little bit about the tension between academic freedom and free speech and how these folks manage to navigate that here? Yeah, I think both the professor and the student are doing pretty well here. I mean, notice how the professor is trying to present important and relevant material uh, passionately and in a way the students uh, can understand it. And the student is paying active attention, is engaging the material, trying to connect it up with other things that he's learned, and trying his best to express the questions and contrary observations that he, kn that he knows of. Uh, and that seems to be the, the right combination for constructively uh, engaging information, learning new information, and they're doing it respectfully. Both of them are, are confident in their initial opinions, but they're also humble enough to listen to what the other person has to say and patient enough to respond and to continue the conversation later. And I think one of the most important things that happens in this scenario is that when the professor has decided that the class needs to move on, uh, the student acknowledges that and they continue the conversation elsewhere. And incidentally, it's, it's helpful, I think, to, to think about that scientific method that they were both talking about and about how this scientific method and really learning in higher education depends on this constructive agreement and constructive disagreement and learning from each other. And in different uh, majors and different departments and different colleges, this may happen in slightly different ways, but it happens every day on campus when we do our work well as faculty and as students. It reminds me of something that, that one of my teachers once told me. He told me that human beings can't really be happy if they don't have some understanding of what they're doing and why. And that at a university, this is a place where we can talk about 
uh, and disagree about and learn about those things. And that's really actually where the, the Chicago Statement of Principles begins, is the point of a university and engaging constructive disagreement. And now, speaking for myself, I'll just note that as a philosopher, I love teaching philosophy because that's a place where we can disagree and we disagree all the time about really important things and learn a lot in the process. And so, again, speaking for myself, I hope to see you all in some philosophy classes <laughs> or maybe getting a cornerstone certificate. Good plug, And you can Pat. talk with me about that afterwards <laughs> if you'd like. Good plug, Pat. Katie and Elisa, any quick thoughts before we go on? Okay, now we're gonna look at uh, how a different student takes a different approach and the result. Evidence for a changing climate abounds from the top of the atmosphere to the depths of the ocean. Folks, we really need to be concerned and start grappling with what a load of crap. There she goes again. I've heard that the best data we've got, satellite data, proves the exact opposite, global, global cooling. You talk about this report, but I've read so many that state the exact contrary. Meanwhile, the liberal media portrays our world going to hell. Isn't this all just a bunch of fake news? Well, there's actually quite an easy explanation for the difference in the data sets. See, the satellite data is prone to interpretive error. Oh, I see. So you think the scientists are manipulating the data to fit their biased theories? Honestly, your arrogance is astounding. There is no need to sling insults. I wasn't saying anything about the research integrity of any scientists. I'm merely trying to help you understand the complex and sometimes subjective factors that impact conclusions on data. So now you just think I'm too stupid to understand what you're saying? I mean, you just like to hear the ringing of your own righteous rhetoric. And anyone who disagrees with you is morally reprehensible, you're a narcissist, and this is still a load of crap. If you're going to continue to insult me and not engage with the material, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. I can't continue conducting the class with your outbursts. Please leave so that the rest of us can move on. Gladly. Okay, Pat. So um, was the professor within her rights to take the action she did with the student here? I think she is. Clearly the student is being disruptive. It's, the problem isn't doing a bit of outside homework and bringing in evidence and arguments, but the repeated interruptions and insults has clearly left the subject matter behind and has really destroyed the possibility of that constructive disagreement. And so the professor really needs to move on. Gotcha. And so we don't want our professors to be uncivil to students, but um, they might ask challenging questions. And by the same token, the student, um, um, part of the learning process is being able to grapple with those, those tough topics, right? Exactly. And the, the professor needs to choose topics well. And we try very hard to do that and have experience doing so. And we hope that the students will engage with passion and engagement. But again, we need to engage each other constructively in the classroom uh, for it to work well. Here's another uh, quote from uh, Jeffrey Stone on this topic. Couldn't be uncivil or disrespectful to their students. Um, but at the same time, the real world will not protect people from th that type of upset. And therefore, I think we do a grave disservice to our students by creating a safe space of a university that shields them from ugliness and from discord and from insult when it exists in the world. Again, my view is the point of education is to prepare students to be effective citizens. Effective citizens cannot be thin-skinned. And that doesn't mean I think faculty should be abusive to students for the sake of it, but I also think that this is part of the reality of life. And one, one might imagine a Peter Pan world in which there is no reality, but that's not our world. And I want my students to be able to go into that world and to be fearless and to be able to take challenge and insult. 
they shouldn't ideally, in the ideal world, they shouldn't, but that's the world in which we live, and I don't want our students to be shielded from things that they have to learn how to deal with. Good stuff. Okay, let's go to our fourth and final scenario for this evening, the case of a protest demonstration against an invited speaker. To educate the Purdue community on the impact of the consumption of animal products, a student organization has invited the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, or PETA, to campus. Some have come to share a different perspective. We have a group of animal science researchers. We have some student members of the Collegiate Beef Growers Alliance, or the CBGA, and a group of concerned women students. They are, they're all gathering outside the forum, and let's see how each of them react. Seriously, I cannot believe that PETA is trying to wage war on the scientific community. Sometimes I don't think they're even aware of the countless lives that are saved due to animal research. I, do you think they would even listen? I doubt it. I agree. I don't think they'd even try, let alone appreciate the human uh, devastation that we've avoided through treatments of HIV AIDS alone through decades of research. Yeah, it's frustrating, but hey, let's try to engage one more time. I think I see some PETA activists over there. We can go talk to them. Sounds good. We can try to get them to see our point of view and explain the benefits of our research. So, uh, Elisa, what do you think about the uh, researchers' approach to the protest? Here, um, it's great that uh, they've decided uh, to engage the speaker. Uh, they are attending the event while expressing their own point of view, uh, and they uh, seem uh, willing to as well uh, try to um, speak with um, those in that organization to try to um, engage in a constructive dialogue to perhaps change minds. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, I think it's important to remember that we all come to Purdue with expertise and experiences that we can bring to bear both in the lab, in the classroom, and also outside of the classroom. And I appreciate those researchers are doing that here. And I also think it's actually excellent that the students who formed this group, something they care about, uh, and they put on a public event to share those ideas with others. And, and together we get the interchange of ideas and we can all learn a lot. That's a great point, especially as we move to the next scene, which is a different student group on the other side of the debate. This is the scene with our uh, Collegiate Beef Growers Alliance. Hey, it's so good to see you again. Thanks for coming. Absolutely. With all these people here, I'm really glad we talked to the dean's office about what we're doing and how to do it right. Yeah, now that we know some basic, pro basic protocol, we can know how to run this as effectively as possible. Right, so as long as we stay in bounds and don't disrupt the event, that's our best bet. PETA may never come around, but hopefully some other people can see our point of view. Yeah, I'm so tired of everyone bashing our organization. Let's go ahead and get inside and make sure everyone sees us. Right, but we're also gonna let people go in and hear the PETA speaker, right? Yeah, we'll do exactly what they told us. We'll walk in with our signs, we'll make sure people see us, maybe chant a few slogans. Then we'll let them talk, we'll listen, we'll wait, and we'll go ahead and head back outside. Okay, let's do this. Katie, the CBGA clearly has done some homework and uh, they've thought a lot about planning their protest. Sounds like they even checked with your office. What coaching might they have received? This was a great model example of, of uh, working with a, an outside group or working with a group that wants to express uh, differing opinions. Um, and so they did a great job. You don't have to meet with the Dean of Students Office, but we're here to help, and so we can help work through uh, the, the specifics to make an event work well. And so in their case, um, we encourage people to do the counter-protesting. The outside signs were great. The chanting were great. They're allowed to go inside to continue that chanting, to bring those signs until the speaker begins. At the point where the speaker would begin his or her uh, uh, message, uh, they would need to take a seat, put the signs in the back of the room, not uh, impair anyone else's view, um, and not heckle. Because at that point, it's time for the speaker to exercise his or her free speech. So we don't infringe upon the free speech of others. So this was really an excellent example. Great. 
Great. And it's a good segue to our last group, uh, the Concerned Women students. We're going to see how they react to a particular feature of the PETA event, the so-called Lettuce Ladies. Oh, hey, Pavi. Did you bring those signs? Yeah, here they are. Great. I can't believe PETA has those lettuce ladies again. I mean, why would you put women in vegetable bikinis in order to draw attention to your propaganda? Honestly, I have no idea, but I can guarantee this. If PETA were the ones protesting, they'd be dumping fake blood and maybe even paint on all these people. Yeah, I mean, their outfits, first of all, I don't think I would ever want to be seen in something like that. It's literally a string bikini with leaves of lettuce barely hanging on. It's way more graphic than a Sports Illustrated swimsuit edition. And I think we can even give them a piece of their own medicine, too. You you're, know those signs right. that you made earlier? Yeah. That red paint? Mm-hmm. Well, I was going to ask you to bring it, but instead, I went to the grocery store and wait for it. I got these babies, some lettuce heads, one for each of us. We can use this to protest the lettuce ladies and give them a piece of our minds. This is fantastic. I Whoa. agree. <laughs> Wait, guys. I see where you're going with this, and I see where you're coming from, but didn't we agree that we would keep this protest within bounds, you know, let them do their thing? Sabrina, to heck with that. Look. There are those lettuce ladies now, up in the crowd. What do you say, Pavi? Are you ready to go? I'm out of here. You All know right. what? Let's do this. On the count of three. One, two, three. <laughs> OK, great job. We successfully ducked the lettuce here on the panel. Alisa, what do you think about uh, their approach? Well, here we've crossed the line, right? We're engaging in violence. We're throwing lettuce. Um, <laughs> it's humorous, but it can do harm. Uh, and so, um, but we also, we saw the, uh, the third student who decided not to go along with it. And that's, you know, sort of the circumstance that, you know, any one of us might find ourselves in, mm -hmm. which is um, you uh, want to uh, show your uh, disagreement with an organization. You've got a plan, and the plan changes. And someone or some people may decide that they want to take it to the next level. And each person has an opportunity to make a choice. And so perhaps you're able to try to convince folks that they shouldn't engage in that behavior, um, or maybe you aren't, uh, but you still get a choice and you get a chance to decide whether you're gonna participate or not participate. And here, the student chose um, not to go along with the, um, with the behaviors. And sometimes you find yourself in a situation where one person takes a step and then others take the step as well. Uh, and so it's important to keep in mind that uh, that does violate uh, university policies, and uh, I'm sure there's a law against throwing lettuce, <laughs> lettuce and hitting people. So we have the dissenting view of the one student, but what about the other two, Katie? What are they looking at? Well, the lettuce launchers would most <laughs> likely be visiting with our folks in student rights and responsibilities. This is a conduct code violation. Um, the, the lettuce heads are projectiles. Projectiles are weapons. Uh, weapons are violence, and violence is not free speech. Great. Pat? Yeah, so as much as we all enjoy a tossed salad, <laughs> I, I think it's important to agree that, that this is violence, especially when there's a crowd of people. One small projectile can lead things to get out of hand, and that's not productive free speech, right? But the other groups, they did a, a very good job, I think, of constructively engaging one another. And they gave other groups the opportunity to express their point of view as well. They didn't 
argued that the university should shut the event down. They didn't prevent others from listening to what was happening. And it's that interchange of ideas outside of the classroom even that we can all learn from that can strengthen our Purdue community and help us to contribute to society in lots of productive ways. Great, Pat. We're, we're very close to wrapping up, but uh, on this point about uh, reacting to invited speakers, uh, we're going to listen to uh, a, an excerpt of uh, uh, an address that former President Obama gave at Howard University just last year. Here's what he says about it. A trend around the country of, of trying to get colleges to disinvite speakers with a different point of view or disrupt a politician's rally. Don't, don't do that. No matter how ridiculous or offensive, you might find the things that come out of their mouths. Because as my grandmother used to tell me, every time a fool speaks, they are just advertising their own ignorance. <laughs> Let them talk. Let them talk. If you don't, you just make them a victim. And then they can avoid accountability. That doesn't mean you shouldn't challenge them. Have the confidence to challenge them. Confidence in the rightness of your position. There will be times when you shouldn't compromise your core values, your integrity. And you will have the responsibility to speak up in the face of injustice. But listen, engage. If the other side has a point, learn from them. If they're wrong, rebut them, teach them beat them on the battlefield of ideas. And just to wrap up, we couldn't resist doing one more from our former president, which in many ways is the perfect summation to send you on your way as you face uh, your exciting careers ahead. Here's one more from former President Obama. Look. The purpose of college is not just, as I said before, to transmit skills. It's also to widen your horizons, to make you a better citizen, to help you to evaluate information, to help you make your way through the world, to help you be more creative. The way to do that is to create a space where a lot of ideas are presented and collide and people are having arguments and people are testing each other's theories and over time people learn from each other because they're getting out of their own narrow point of view and having a broader point of view. So Arnie, I'm sure has the same experience that I did, which is when I went to college, suddenly there were some folks who didn't think at all like me. And if I had an opinion about something, they'd look at me and say, well, that's stupid. And then they'd describe how they saw the world. And they might have had different sense of politics, or they might have a different view about poverty, or they might have a different perspective on race. And sometimes their views would be infuriating to me. But it was because there was this space where you could interact with people who didn't agree with you and had different backgrounds than you that I then started testing my own assumptions. And sometimes I changed my mind. Sometimes I realized, you know what, maybe I've been too narrow-minded. Maybe I didn't take this into account. Maybe I should see this person's perspective. So. That's what college, in part, is all about. So that's a wrap. I want to thank our panel. I want to thank our student leaders. Thank you so much for your attention. Have a great BGR, a great year. Boiler up. <laughs>